Good morning. This is my third video as to why I celebrate Christmas. Why Christmas? And I want to remind you that in my first video, I testified to the fact that I don't celebrate a myth. I don't believe in Father Christmas. I don't believe in elves. I don't believe that they stay in the North Pole. Christmas is a time in which I celebrate the reality of God, that God exists, that He has a dwelling place in the third heaven, that He was the one who created heaven and earth, that He is the one that created me in His image. Secondly, I was reminded that this God doesn't just rule from the universe. He doesn't rule from out of space somewhere. He actually became human and walked amongst us. As we found out, Isaiah said, unto us a son is born. And this son that was born was Jesus, born in Bethlehem. He was the Christ. He was God, Emmanuel, walking with us. And what is the sad thing about it, dear friends, is that when he came down to his own, his own did not receive him. I wonder if in the way which we celebrate Christmas and we kind of push Christ out of the picture, are we perhaps rejecting his presence in our lives? Today, the third reason is I believe, and the reason why I celebrate Christmas, is that Christ came down to this world, not just to walk amongst us, but he came down to take my place. And I'm going to explain this. Now, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 23, and in Galatians, chapter 3, verse 6, and in Romans, chapter 4, verse 3, we find a very interesting revelation regarding the person Abraham. And Christmas is a time in which I celebrate what Abraham celebrated. In verse 3 of chapter 4 of Romans, the word says this, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. Now, what does this really mean? What is it that made Abraham a righteous man? And I want you to take you back to the beginning where this encounter with Abraham and God takes place. And in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, in chapter 15, I find an interesting dialogue that takes place between Abraham and God. It says there in verse 1, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. So I want you to notice at this particular time, his name is not Abraham, but Abraham. Do not be afraid, Abraham, for I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So here we see that Abraham finds himself in a very difficult situation. He has no heir. Then verse 4 says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir. But a son coming out of your own body will be your heir. Can you imagine this? Abraham was about a hundred years old at this time. Then God shows him something. He took him outside and said, Look at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. So God makes a commitment to Abraham, who has no heir. And he says, As you see all these stars. I will make your descendants numberless like them. And then the word says this to me. Verse 6. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it, it to him as righteousness. You see, Abraham believed God. Abraham believed that God was going to do what was so impossible. Now, you might wonder to yourself, what has this really got to do with, with the fact that Christ took my place? Now, dear friends, first of all, I believe that Christ came to this world. A lot of people are, are questioning that. Isaiah chapter 53, and Isaiah is known to be the gospel prophet. In Isaiah 53, I read this, and I'm going to just read the scripture there. Who has believed our message? I mean, that's a really interesting question. 
there's a lot of people who are speculating and drawing doubt to the reality of what I'm going to read to you. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Then it says this about Jesus. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to, tr to attract us to him. That means there was nothing outstanding about Christ as a child. He wasn't tall. He wasn't strong. He wasn't and maybe extremely handsome. There was nothing about him. He wasn't even rich. He wasn't born into a family of status. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. And yet he was God. This Emmanuel, this creator of heaven and earth in human form. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Listen to that dear friends. He was familiar with our suffering. Like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, verse 4, so powerful. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God. When we looked at him, we thought it was God that was doing this to him. But he actually took our sorrow. He took our pain. He took our affliction on himself. It wasn't his own affliction. It was ours. Then it says there, Surely it took upon our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Dear friends, Christ took my place. So that in taking my place, he could place me in his place. And his place was that I could receive healing. We all... Not some of us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Isn't that interesting? We, we haven't turned to God. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All our sins was laid upon Christ. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Isaiah is saying, our sins did this to him. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. I mean, he had two thieves and murderers hanging next to him, and with the rich in his death. And it's so interesting how that in his death, we have this recorded, that he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. You know, Jesus said that the devil had no foothold on him. He had not once submitted to the devil's temptations. Yet it was the Lord, sorry, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And through, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And he will be of the Lord, will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will set the light of life. And be satisfied. Sorry, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By this knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquity, iniquities. You now, what is so incredible, dear friends, is that I'm reminded on Christmas Day that Jesus came and took my place so that I can have eternal life. He died the death. I'm supposed to die so that I might live the life that he so beautifully gained for me. That's why I celebrate Christmas, dear friends.
I'm reminded that this baby in a manger was my substitute. He was my lamb slain for my sins. He was my Passover. He was my ticket to heaven. And I'm grateful and reminded about this at every Christmas. God bless you.